I'd like to welcome you today to another one of the conversations that I've been having in the Psychologies of the Earth lecture series, which is being hosted as a part of the Hosting Earth Conference at Boston College in collaboration with the Psychological Humanities and Ethics lecture series through the Lynch School at Boston College. My name is Matthew Clementi. I'm joined today by Ed Casey, Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at SUNY Stony Brook who has an illustrious career on uh, you know, working through the themes and topics we'll be talking about today. I'm so honored to be joined by him. Just to give you a brief overview of this series, what we're doing in the Psychologies of the Earth lecture series is talking about the current eco-crisis and how questions of ethics, uh, psychology, and environmental life intersect together in this space. So, Without much further ado, Ed, I'm so happy to be talking to you today. And one of the things I like to do when I start these conversations is ask the thinkers that I'm uh, meeting with and engaging with to talk a little bit about how they understand the theme of this conference, Hosting Earth, and what it means to both play host to and be hosted by the Earth, how we situate ourselves in that relationship. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about your work and how it intersects with the uh, theme of the conference. Thank you, Matthew. Glad to join you all, um, even if somewhat belatedly this year. Um, I'm gonna talk about how I came to um, be particularly uh, concerned with the natural world and its phenomenological significance including its ethical significance, though I won't speak about that explicitly. Um, I come from a from Kansas, from a rural background of farmlands, Flint Hills, uh, and, a, and feeling very close to nature as I was young. However, uh, as I moved along in my educational career, I retreated um, into libraries, study halls, carousels, uh, as um, a young philosopher, I felt my task, my duty was to write, um, and write I did. Um, that really meant leaving behind the natural world in any significant, ongoing, intense way. I was really in a period of retreat for 20 years, uh, from my high school years when I first discovered philosophy uh, all the way through my early 30s. Then my writing took a sudden turn that brought me back to the earth, we can say. I was writing a book on memory and um, I wanted to write a chapter called Memory of Place, Place Memory. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that Western thinkers have rarely after Aristotle, who did say some things about it, although I think incorrectly, but nevertheless started to speculate, I realized that there's a paucity of serious thought about place, particularly place of nature uh, and place in nature. So that just changed everything. I, I put down all of my other plans for writing and began to write about place. And place took me, of course, straight into the natural world. Um, my first book on place, and I've written four of them, appeared in 1987 and had a section titled Wild Places with, that featured parts with titles like Going Wild in the Land and the Ark of Desolation and the Array of Description. My focus was on what I called moments of nature, moments that included such terms as sensuous surface, ground things, arc atmosphere, and so on. I was engaging in phenomenological description, but instead of seeking essences, as I had in my earlier writings on imagination and most of memory, I was seeking descriptive themes that populate the lived experience of nature. It was, it was a matter of getting clear about how the natural world presents itself to us in, in what thematic formats and how these formats create special senses of place that cannot be found or rarely found in urban settings. I was not yet concerned with what I came to call the fate of place 
that is how a place fares on earth, especially as exploited and manipulated by human beings. But I was very much concerned with the power of natural home places. And I wrote about how a central part of the misery of forced migration is being, uh, being forced to live homelands with which one is not merely familiar, but that have become an integral part of one's individual and collective identity. I was doing some work on migration at the US-Mexico border and wrote a separate book on uh, how the border wall actually destroyed the place, um, bifurcated it, uh, undermined it, not only for humans, but for animals who live along the border. Um, somewhere in this period of time, when I wrote that first book, late 80s, I became a charter member of the Environmental Philosophy Association, closely associated with SPEP, uh, and joined with other environmentally minded phenomenologists, such as David Wood, uh, to examine the plight of the earth in more graphic detail. Um, but instead of turning to environmental activism, as was often the focus in early meetings of this remarkable group of young phenomenologists concerned with the fate of the earth, I continued to explore the natural world through a series of books whose focus continued to be place throughout, representing place in landscape painting and maps, for example, uh, in which I had chapters titled things like Finding Place for the Elemental, Apocalyptic and Contemplative Sublimity, and Rectangularity and Truth. It's a matter of what happens to the earth when it assumes the format of images of landscape painted or mapped. And as I know from my own painting, landscape is both affirmed as presented and transformed both at once. Another closely related book of this era was titled Earth Mapping, Artists Reshaping Landscape, where I discussed the work of contemporary artists whose primary theme is the earth. That is how they reshape landscape, extending from Robert Smithson to Wilhelm de Kooning. That was the last of my books that were expressly and entirely on place. But I wasn't done with place yet. The World on Edge, appearing in 2010, discusses the way that edges configure the earth as we encounter it directly with our bodies. Edges of rivers and mountains, lakes, lawns, parks. Uh, because I came to realize that the surface of the earth cannot be what it is, except as far as it is shaped naturally or indeed artificially, all too often um, forced into shapes that it does not itself wish to assume. That's what really drove me to appreciate the importance of the edge of things. Um, overall, you'd have to say that I've been preoccupied with, some would say obsessed with, the spatiality of place, place in its multiple avatars. I have come into place full force, as in the direct description of being in a particular place, as well as obliquely via mapping as well as painting. But all of it is by way of description in one form or another. That's a matter of doing phenomenology of place where phenomenology is construed in a very generous post husserlian sense. My first two books on imagination and memory uh, sought essential structures of these psychical activities. But when toward the end of the second book, as I mentioned, I took up memory of place, I realized, wait a minute, I'm into a different game here. Something else has to be said and thought. And it was revelatory to me when I realized that Husserl never did address place as such, it fell between the cracks of his otherwise well-paved method. And that realization led to some 20 years of writing on place that I have just recounted. Looking back, I can say that although philosophy, reading it and writing it initially took me away from direct experiences of earth, 
that I knew when very young in Kansas, it eventually brought me back to earth thanks to my pursuit of the phenomenology of place in writing as well as painting. Back to the things themselves, indeed, or rather back to that which underlies and precedes all finite things, that is the earth. The first of all things and the improper basis of phenomenology pursued to its last or rather its first frontier. Um, a concluding thought in these preliminary ruminations. There is an affinity between phenomenology and its post Husserlian modalities and the dyad of nature and place. In many respects, this is the converse of what Jacques Derrida did in his own radical departure from Husserl, a departure that in Derrida's case favors such things as grammatology, trace, and text, all in the context of apparatic indirection rather than of direct description. If Derridean deconstruction plays at the convoluted surface of discourse, the phenomenology of nature, nature that, can, that not only includes places, but many other forces and vectors, it dives down into the earth. We can say that it hosts the earth from below. And in this spirit, and to conclude these opening remarks, we can say that I've been hosting Earth through my writings and paintings about it, diversely so, but always in appreciation, indeed awe, of what Husserl himself at the end of his career came to call the Earth bases, Erd Boden. So those are some opening remarks and we can elaborate from here. And Matthew, um, I think has some questions for me. Yeah, no, we... absolutely. Thank you. Um, you know, as you were talking, uh, a couple of things jumped to mind. So I hope you won't mind me just trying to piece together a few of my thoughts and then I can ask you some questions on them. You know, you're talking about initially how um, writing took you away from place away from the lived you know world of nature in which you uh grew up and experienced and i was thinking as you were saying that of uh the analogy that plato makes at the end of the phaedrus of writing uh as analogous to farming and to tilling the earth and sowing seeds in the earth here you know writing is can be this type of thing that bears fruit and he uses some really um fruitful for you know lack of a better word uh nature imagery to describe the process of writing and yet at the same time writing can uh similarly build walls and barriers you know you're talking about the walls at the border being barriers that prevented uh and and displaced people and nature and so i was thinking about art in relation to nature writing painting as being potentially open an opening a way of opening um, us up to place and to nature and also potentially a way of closing us down or sheltering us away from it um, with that in mind it's something else that just jumped to mind and i happen to have the book here because i'm just reading it right now i'd like to read just a, a quick line and maybe this might be an inroad into some of your recent work because I know you, you've been working and writing on trees recently. And I'm reading a, a great novel by uh, the philosopher Miguel de Unamuno called Fog. And this is just one passing reflection that one of the characters has. He's sitting in a park in the middle of a city and he's looking up at the trees and he says, those domesticated urban trees standing at attention in straight lines watered by an irrigation ditch when it didn't rain, extending their roots under the plaza's flagstones, those imprisoned trees waiting to see the sunrise set over the rooftops, those caged trees that perhaps yearned for distant forests. forests. Augusto felt mysteriously drawn to them. Birds sang in their branches, city birds that learned to flee from children and sometimes approach the old folks who offer them breadcrumbs, so he has this kind of notion of trees being both something that exists in nature and, and for the world and in the world, and also something that we domesticate, which is not something that we typically think of, but we bring them into human constructs and spaces as we build them and as we cultivate them. 
And I know that this has some kind of um, resonances with some recent work that you've been doing. So I'd like to ask you to kind of maybe use that as an inroad to lead into some thoughts on other things you're working on. Yeah, I'm writing a book with Michael Martyr called The Place of Trees. Um, um, Martyr is a naturalist and a very distinguished writer on plants, wrote a, a great book called The Philosophy of Plants. <clears throat> and um, he's proposed that the two of us write this book on trees. Um, and one of the striking things that's emerged in my thinking and writing about it is the way that trees <clears throat> communicate among themselves and have a social life that has only been unearthed, unearthed literally <laughs> in the last uh, decade or so. Um, so that it is in that respect, trees are living coming from below, not just material support, but highly coded semiotically sophisticated ways by which tree roots actually do, <laughs> they talk to each other, uh, not in human language, but in arboreal language. And uh, it's it really a, a wonderful opening to rethinking the life of trees. And, that, and that's really where we're going in, in, in this book. My part is to uh, say what how that modifies our idea of place as merely um, stabilitas loci, that is, you know, providing stability, anchorage, and so forth. But here's a place, the place of trees, that is very highly animated, highly articulated, uh, although invisible and underground. Hence, we have not fully understood this until quite recently, and it's still being explored by Volleben, uh, for example, and Sheldrake in recent works as well as by Marjolaine Oele, whose great book, Eco-Affectivity, uh, I've just written a long review of that for research in phenomenology. Uh, and her argument is that soil <clears throat> also is a much more complex uh, and highly intelligent um, way of being in the world that we have neglected as philosophers. But let me go back to your first remark about the Phaedrus. Um, yeah, I, um, I have some sympathy with that. Um, in fact, it was when I realized that my writing, I was in, in my, I was in my mid thirties, though reaching out to a natural place and, and indeed articulating thoughts about it um, um, at some length, maybe too great length, wasn't getting all the way there. And at that moment in my life, I turned to painting I, I had been into painting when I was very young. This had been actively discouraged by the boarding school that I was sent to by my parents who feared that I would become a bohemian. And so I set it aside, being an obedient young lad. Um, and suddenly my mid thirties, I thought, wait a minute, uh, there's another way into the natural world other than language, uh, than verbal discourse. And so I, I really took up painting in a very serious way, joined a group of painters. We, we rented houses in Maine in the summer and painted together. And believe me, this was another inroad into the earth that I found really quite extraordinary. And it was radically nonverbal. Um, so for me, this, this has meant an important supplement to writing about place, painting place. Anyway, and that's the right term in English. Think about it as a directly transitive verb. You paint a place. Um, and I've done a fair amount of reflection on this too, of course, in writing, because after all, I am a philosopher and <laughs> philosophers are supposed to write and publish. But nevertheless, for me, it, it really opened up a second path um, to the natural world. And I felt the natural world was indeed hosting my efforts, even inviting them. Um, and these had a certain freedom about them, which writing never will, not unless I were a poet, which I'm not. Prose, 
uh, is in this respect deeply constraining in a way that painting is not. So this really introduced a whole second um, thematic in my approach to nature and is still going strong, actually. I paint as much as I write. And this is, it seems to me, something which philosophers of nature uh, and particularly phenomenologists of nature need to really take seriously uh, and consider the, the real possibility of other semioci, other semiotic ways of expressing their experience of, of the natural world. You know, it, uh, a theme that's come up with multiple people I've spoken to and at the conference itself uh, that seems to resonate here is that one of the ways that we uh, can be more hospitable to the earth and also, uh, as you were saying, feel hosted by the earth is to engage more in uh, artistic forms of creation, forms of creation that aren't uh, exploitative but actually are attempting to um, honor and, and do honor to the world as it presents itself to us. I wonder one um, topic that's related, and maybe you could just speak a little bit more about this, but I wonder how art uh, functions into, for you more explicitly, our understanding of place. You know, what is it about art itself, the creative process, that helps us to understand our situatedness within the world and to appreciate that in a way that's different to or maybe resists the temptation that we feel to exploit the world and it's exploit its resources. What makes art um, and poesis different? Well, in a brief um, comment on this, particularly painting, it's all I can really speak for. Uh, I find that the way in which the lived body is solicited to make free motions uh, that are not confined to the linear as writing uh, must be um, liberates uh, one's way of ingressing into nature in a far more direct way than is possible through writing. Again, with the exception of poetry, which I am not here addressing. Uh, but in prose, um, including very lyrical prose. I mean, there, there, there's certainly in Merleau-Ponty and others, uh, an absolutely you know, beautiful way by which they do in fact inscribe nature in prose. Still, still, it's not the same as the gestures, the motions, the actions, the live body takes when it's painting uh, or sculpting or doing other things with the body that is in touch with nature. And so uh, I, I, I consider it not merely supplementary, but an essential um, complement to writing about nature. It doesn't have to be painting. It could be any form of art, of course. Um, but I, I do believe that philosophers of nature, including philosophers of place, uh, should indeed explore these alternative methods of moving into the natural world and opening it up from within by their own bodily gestures in a way that cannot happen sitting at a desk in a cubicle <laughs> confined by the page and the line and the syntax and all the rest, the overdetermination of writing philosophical prose is here at least partially undone um, and a different modality of our ingression into nature emerges from such activity as this. So then it seems uh, as though um, by kind of returning ourselves to bodily existence, you know, it's that that's kind of part of the essential move that this type of creativity, this type of art brings us back to ourselves as bodily, you know, carnal creatures. And in that movement, we move back toward nature, which is, of course, you know, physical space and place and proximity and whatever else. <clears throat> and so it's by recapturing uh, carnal existence that we move toward um, a different type of way of relating to nature than we're uh, potentially used to. Is that um, a big aspect of it? 
Yes, and, and what, Rich, Rich, what Richard Carney calls touch in his recent book of that title is relevant here. Um, it's not only seeing nature or thinking nature, uh, but the tangibility of the artwork becomes the felt analog of immersion of the lived body in the natural world itself. Um, kind of extraordinary. Um, but it, and this is not really a matter of sublimation, it's very direct experience. So the experience of painting itself is not trivial. I mean, we're always looking at the result, but actually uh, I'm very interested in the ongoing um, living experience of painting the natural world. I paint landscapes, seascapes, mountainscapes and so forth. And I always start from the natural world but then I significantly depart from that toward uh, something that could be considered semi-natural, semi-abstract, some of both, uh, as if to say, as if to encompass these two aspects of my own life uh, as a thinker and as a painter in the painting itself. <laughs> now, this is a somewhat impossible project, but I find it challenging uh, and inspiriting and reviving uh, when I do it. Um, my own writing has, um, the place of writing has changed. Now I write whenever the weather's right. I write outside, among trees, in plants, with birds. Um, this is, is not trivial for me. Um, I think it's consistent with my emphasis upon the importance of place is never entirely secondary, not merely a matter of location or position, uh, but a matter, a very basic way in which we have being in the world uh, in Heidegger's original sense, but now realized differently uh, in a much more concrete series of modalities that I believe the natural world itself calls for you know, in its own complexity, um, calls out from us. And that's a way of understanding hosting. Uh, you see, not just being open, not merely being inviting, not merely being hospitable, um, but actively drawing out of those who participate um, forms of experience they would not otherwise engage in. I would never have thought I would be uh, doing serious painting back in my 20s when I was a, a you know, a purebred. Um, Husserlian. Um, oh my, <laughs> I can't believe that that happened. But, but things have changed since then significantly. Well, Ed, this has been absolutely wonderful. I wish we had another half an hour or hour to keep going through this, but um, I've just appreciated so much your phenomenological insights and your insights into how art relates to hosting Earth. Thank you so much for being here today and having this conversation with us. And I hope that we can continue to have a conversation going forward on these topics. Uh, thank you for everyone who's attended this. Again, this is the Psychologies of the Earth lecture series done in collaboration with the Hosting Earth Conference and the Psychological Humanities and Ethics Lecture Series at the Lynch School at Boston College. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for uh, having me uh, speak uh, in this context. <laughs>